Hello everyone and thank you so much for tuning in to watch the first in our series of Neurodivergent Athlete video blogs. So today we are very grateful to be joined by Greg Searle MBE. He's an Olympic rower who has raced at four Olympic Games and medalled at three of them. And a little known fact about Greg is that he is also dyslexic. And he talks to us about his experiences of being a neurodivergent athlete. So without further ado, over to Greg to tell you his story in his own words. We really hope that you get something out of watching and thank you so much for tuning in. I had the resources to be a good rower. We, I got into the, the pair with my brother. We had the real um, strengths and weaknesses of rowing with a sibling, which was we, he could get the best out of me. Um, and, and we had that, but there was also sometimes quite fiery. Um, and so we won in 1992 um, and that was fantastic, obviously. Um, then we did the Cox pair again in 93. And I think there was a time then when I wanted to grow up and be more my own person, mm. um, which was the story I told you about when, yeah, when we were rowing along one day. And, and I guess all I could say was that we had a very set pattern, which was he was the older brother and was sort of the brains of the operation. And I was a sort of strong physical person who sat in the stroke seat um, and, and did what I was more or less did what I was told. And I think in 93, I remember a particular session when we didn't have Gary Herbert coxing us. So we weren't getting very great leadership from within the coxing seat. So we had to take it on ourselves. We had this bit of an argument on the water and I jumped over the side and swam off. And I swam off at Molesy to the wrong bank. Um, <laughs> I came out on the sort of, um, you know, the, the Hampton side, if anyone knows that stretch. And I had to jog off down the, the bank to get away from the boat in the middle of the river. Um, and then I crossed the bridge onto the island, climbed through someone's garden, and then swam back into the, the, the correct side on the, the Molesy side. I sort of cooled down physically and, and emotionally um, <laughs> with all the river swimming. And by but, the time you're like off, you're just like head hanging low, like, oh, what have I done? Yeah, it was a bit of what have I done? But I th think it was also a bit of in the moment, probably going, I, I want to grow up. You know, it's a funny way to say you want to grow up, but I want to be an equal party in this, not an under sort of party in this, which was quite an interesting sort of, sort of time, really. Um, and Johnny and I got to do the Cox pair again, and we got to win again, and we got to win by more at the World Championships in 93. And that was really good for us, having sort of won the Cox pair surprising the Abignales and coming from behind to actually win solidly and from in front um, and then and then it seemed right for us to get into a four with some other people and sort of share the share the relationship with some other mm. people which was Tim Foster and Rupert Oppolzer we went to the Atlanta Olympics and we got a bronze medal and we were disappointed we really felt we we should have got more I was probably at, we were all probably at our physical peaks mm. in our mid-20s um, my choice then was again to sort of say, I want to grow up. I want to do my own thing. So I became the single. Oh, did um, you? I did not know this. Yeah. Yeah. I raced the single. It's funny you're talking about Egg Bolette because I went back to Egg Bolette in 97, um, as the single, um, and won a bronze in the single at the Worlds. That's so impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And no, that was massive for me. It's probably the second best thing of my career. So all of that time was, was a very important period for me of becoming more self-aware um, and, and possibly, you know, just growing up, being, being a bit less of a dick, um, which <laughs> in some ways, you know, I, I maybe was quite uh, insular and, and, and thought that I would always keep winning by just doing the same things, but actually realising, no, I had to think differently and do some other things and, and experiment a bit. Um, and the single was brilliant for that. Um, and I was also coached by a guy called Harry Marn. And Harry, I don't know if you know, do you know that name, Cara? I don't think I do. He was, so he was a New Zealander and he's a real sort of guru of coaching. 
And the style he used with me of coaching me and my single would be sort of, again, whether this, this works for you, most closely aligned sort of Yoda from Star Wars. So okay. it was very much uh, an empowering way of coaching me, asking me questions, getting me to think for myself, getting me to find strength within and skills within and technique within. So rather than coaching me towards a model, you know, good sculling should look like this. Yes. It was much more saying, what have you got and how do you get the best out of yourself? See, I love that. And I think that works really well for people who maybe think slightly differently. So especially neurodiverse people, but like yeah. anyone who doesn't fit the typical mold. Like, yeah. I think I, I said it to you earlier as well, but I said, like, I've realized, oh, no, I realized it quite early on, but I tried to sort of like shoehorn myself into the athlete that people wanted me to be, which was yeah. does what they're told. But I hate being I don't just hate being told what to do, but okay, it's like yeah, yeah. I have some kind of pathological demand avoidance, which is actually yeah. a thing. <laughs> like yeah, if someone yeah. tells me what to do, I'm just it's almost like it doesn't compute. Whereas yeah. like what you're saying, having someone sort of suggest I find the answers from within, especially if you're what you are a little bit different and you don't fit that yeah. mold that they're working from, I can yeah. see how that would be like so useful and so like it would actually get results way more than trying to shoehorn someone into a box they don't fit into and yeah. like I feel like that is like an incredible example because you going from being a rower um in the coxed pair and the coxless four and then going into the single and getting a bronze medal like I said it already but people don't realize how unusual that is yeah and it's a real testament like that achievement is a real testament to obviously your effort but you being allowed to explore yourself and yeah. like you said find the strength within yourself your way of doing it yeah um no. yeah. and harry really let that happen and, and as a simple as an example i remember going to henley to race in the diamonds at henley uh for the first time in 97 and, and a couple of things one was i came down for the first race and I can't remember who I was racing, but I was, I'd won the trials. I was pretty fast British scholar. And Harry said to me, on a scale of one to 10, how up for it are you? And I said, oh, well, we're probably seven out of 10, but you know, I reckon by the time I get to the start, I can get to a nine for this heat. Okay. And he said, look, you're going to beat this guy. <laughs> Why don't you go out and enjoy it? Just try and get it down to a two or a three and just enjoy being on the water and, and having your first race at Henley in the single. And again, for me, that was so different to anything I'd experienced before. And then, legend. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And then I remember getting to a six lane race and him going and me saying, right, so, so Harry, what's the race plan? You know, what, what do I do at 250? What do I do at 500? And he said, well, look, you know, the race plan is a bag of tricks. Yeah. And you know how to make your boat go faster. And I had my cues, which would be, you know, to, to, put my hands out and feel like I'm dropping the ball, like drop the ball yes, yeah. and then I'll pick the ball up with my feet and all this sort of stuff. So I had all these cues, whatever they might be. And said, so well, just the race plan is bag of tricks. When you need to go faster, get one of them out of the bag, do something to make the boat go faster and do that until you're in front. And then once yeah. you're in front, just stay in front. And, and again, it was gave all the power to me as well yeah. to go, you own it. You know how to make your boat go faster. Do what you need to do to make your boat go faster and stay in front of the other guy. Yeah. So for me, at that time in my life, I think my wife, Jenny, has to take massive credit because she is very emotionally intelligent. She asks great questions. She's really interested in people and, and helped me. She seemed to be interested in me, which was nice. Um, <laughs> And that got me kind of thinking and opening my brain more. Um, and then I had Harry, who was an influence doing that. And then I joined this company, Lane 4, which had a lot of sort of sp psychologists, sports psychology into business. So they would need me to tell my story to, to help me understand that, to help the group understand that. So, so I might tell a story like... Um, jumping out of the boat with my brother and saying this was a bad example of giving feedback 
yeah. and go, how do we give feedback in a way that doesn't make people metaphorically jump out of the boat? Um, and we've all told these stories, you know, about goal setting and motivation and those sorts of things. So handling pressure. So I had to figure out what were my life stories that were meaningful to anyone else. Mm. And they helped me understand my life stories by doing that. So I think I became much more self-aware and I raced a single in this period. Um, and I chose my own friends and that sort of stuff in a slightly different way, rather than just being really in my tram lines. The sad part of this story was that um, Harry uh, was diagnosed with cancer. So Harry got sick from about 97 through till 2001. Um, and as Harry got more sick, my performance went got worse um up it's until, not surprising if someone is like yeah and we were, we were really to together like you and, as an athlete and like yeah no no we were really together so much so that i remember um we went to south africa just the two of us to train on a training camp lottery funding had started coming along we went to the worlds and i drove um my car so i we trained in Verazi, like the team does um, and then the worlds the following year were in Cologne and I drove my own car. Jenny flew out at the end of the training camp and I spent the last couple of days of the training camp in Italy with Jenny. And then we drove to Cologne and met the squad in Cologne for me to race. Um, and Harry gave me the sort of autonomy to do that. That's but awesome. my performances went from a bronze medal in 97 to fifth place. <laughs> Uh, to 14th place um, and so I didn't qualify the single for the Worlds for the Olympics yeah. in Sydney. And I shouldn't overlook Steve Gunn who was my coach at oh. Hampton School yeah. um, and then Steve Gunn coached me in 92 and 96 to be an Olympic champion. So Steve, I think, set in place some really solid foundations. And Steve's approach for me as a young person was really good. Yeah. Basically, when I was ready to sort of do what I was told, I had Steve and I had my brother, who were both quite strong characters, and I was ready to, to fit in and be disciplined and do what they needed. And that, I think, coupled with some ability to think for myself, and they gave me enough ability to think for myself, was good enough to get me winning the juniors and then winning the, the Olympic, Olympic gold at 20. I didn't want to be told what to do. And maybe yeah. that wasn't good. Maybe if I just rolled straight into being coached by Jürgen, I might have actually achieved more, but I didn't. I wanted to be my own person. I think when Jürgen came, it felt very binary. You either went to Leander and did Jürgen's thing, or you stayed separate and did your own thing. And to me, it took me a while to figure out what my own thing was. And I think for me, it was that time with Harry and going in the single that I worked out what my own thing was. The weird thing was then when Harry got sick, the pendulum swung back and I needed to come to Leander and train under Jürgen. And I think that didn't work for me and I didn't work for it. I'm not blaming Jürgen or the system. It's just I'd gone from having lots of control and and being really keen on, on how I wanted to row and what boat I wanted to row in. And I mean, I went to Jürgen and I said, I want an Empacker. You know, I, I think Empackers are better boats than Ailings. We were all rowing in Ailings at the time. And Jürgen said, if you want to row in, in an Empacker, go back in your single. But if you want to row in my team, then we row in Ailings and we rowed in an Ailings pair. And, and he was probably right. It probably didn't make any difference. But all of the time I was wrestling in my head with, I want to have some control on what we're doing here. If I leap way forward to 2012 and coming back and being in the eight, we had to have a really strong race plan so that all nine of us could agree to it. Yeah. And we literally signed it as a contract. We're going to do this at this point, this at this point, and we literally signed a bit of paper in 2010. Um, but I felt like we'd been able to co-create that. Mm. And so having co-created it, I really bought into it in 2010. Um, but we've leapt ahead 
that gave me some of what I'd had in the single, but in a way that was workable with a really good group of people. Yeah. So I think so still, me, still like a comp you're still as a group, you're coming to that decision. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so it's because like you're saying, I think in a single, it's good to have individual responsibility. But when we start to bring a crew together, you know, we often sort of say, oh no, the song's too much of a scholar, they won't fit in. You know. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, what we need to do is figure out how we get the best out of individuals and bring that together as a collective. And so I've had some experiences in crew boats where we were able to do that because we had a different kind of conversation and then we all had really good buy-in mm -hmm. and then I think we could sign up to something. But, but this was all stuff that I didn't know. And I think like you're saying, it's stuff that we usually don't know. We just go with what's always gone before. Yeah. And that I think is, is often not helpful and often less helpful for neurodiverse people than other people. Yeah. Because we like things differently. Yeah. And I was really excited to come to Caversham in 2010 because suddenly it was full of M packers. And <laughs> I. That's why you were excited. Felt really <laughs> excited. And I felt like I could choose to be part of it. So I think it was that element of choice, which yeah. was different. So I think when I was 28 and sort of in that Sydney campaign, and I felt sort of, I had no option but to be at Leander um, and training under Jürgen. It's not so much Leander, but training under Jürgen and, and his setup and regime. I chose to be part of it in Caversham. I think there was, a little bit more flexibility than I'd experienced in the past. And I think because I came back and Jürgen welcomed me, and I think he welcomed me, prodigal son would probably be stretching it, but I think he liked having old Greg around because if old Greg could do it, then it would challenge other people to have to do it. Yes, that's so And good. sometimes I felt like I did have a, what can I say, a more adult, adult relationship with Jürgen than I'd felt before, which felt quite parent-child. And I think being treated adult, adult is enough for me to then be able to fit in. I think as we talk about neurodivergence, within the bounds of what I've got, as long as I feel like I've been asked and I'm included and my ideas are included, then I can fit in. I guess I'm able to make a behavior shift and rather than what's totally in my identity and my my patterns which are maybe harder to shift for some people um and and so yeah now age 50 i mean like i say i think i've found what i'm best at at work um which as i say it's still i suppose knowing my strengths which are doing the basics really well um and i think a lot of people go away from the basics and and I, I am open to new learning and I am I do I think have a growth mindset but I have a growth mindset within layering that on top of some things that I think I'm quite mm. I, I, I know what I'm good at um, and, I, and I hope I can bring that to the clients I work with either at speaking events yesterday I was facilitating a team event which I absolutely loved um, and then I coach people one-on-one -on -one. Mm. and again uh, I, I want to make sure they know what they're getting if they get me as their coach. I'm not the person who's going to help them read and write the board reports, but I am going to be someone who's going to challenge them around their personal resilience or how they're mm. dealing with their team and the engagement of their team. Um, in the neurodiversity, neurodivergent kind of world, like a lot of people don't like this uh, phrase super strength because yeah. they feel so disabled by their condition or yeah. the characteristics of it um they just don't believe that they're good at anything and I just I I don't believe that I think the environments can be disabling and a lack of self-awareness or supporters or role models um yeah. can mean that you don't you can't see your strengths, but I, I genuinely think everybody has something that they're really good at. And if we could all understand it and harness it, then we would all be able to live much happier lives, but then also give to others as yeah. well, um, which it sounds like is what you're doing. So, yeah, again, I, I, 
I don't want to feel like I'm so altruistic that I'm just giving to others because, <laughs> but I do like to, I enjoy that feeling of making a difference, of, of being helpful. Mm. Um, and if I can do that with, with clients and that's a job, then that's absolutely brilliant. Um, and if I can find space and do that in a way which fits, like the commentating that I do for World Rowing, if I do that and people appreciate what I'm doing, then I'll keep doing it. Mm. Um, if there's other people who are better at it, then I'm also very ready to, to not do it. Um, but I feel like hopefully I can do something which, which adds value. And if I do that, that's, you know, it's, it's lovely. It's a privilege to be able to, to do what I do and call work. Um, mm. And I really enjoy that. You know, I know that, I guess it's a, it's a, a, a different level of, of impact that neurodiversity has on you. And, and I feel like mine's relatively mild and I'm able to, to, to do things without some of the challenges that other people face. But I'm equally happy to share that. And if it's useful, then, then again, really happy to do that. Because like you say, I think there's magic within people. But if that gets lost because there isn't psychological safety and an environment where they can be themselves and figure out how to get the best out of themselves, then we're going to waste talent, aren't we? Mm. if you know if you're in a situation where you can't exist within a team or you can't be accurately diagnosed or others come along like that then mm. that's that's a massive loss it's a it's a miss isn't it well i guess if anyone's still with us we can say thanks very much for listening <laughs> to the whole of this talk <laughs> thanks, thanks we so hope you've enjoyed for it watching and listening yeah. Um, and it's been really great um, and watch this space for more interesting people because I firmly believe that people who are different are I don't want to say the most interesting but are the most interesting so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool. thanks Cara right, thank you. To to you thanks, thanks.